Two programmers are going to compete to program an ESP32 in only two hours. Ready, set, go! First we have Nicholas who's using Platform IO coupled with Amazon AWS for his cloud interface. Then we have Kevin who's also using Platform IO but he's using Blink for his cloud interface. I'm just setting up the build flags for the, um, the TFT ESPI library configures the proper dev board with the proper driver. Platform IO makes it easy to include build flags so like defines you would normally put in your main code so you don't have to go into the main like source code and modify it. Let's see, Kevin is using ChatGPT, which is totally legal for this battle. I'm reaching out and it's going to do all the work for me and I'm going to be done in 10 minutes. You know, that's, yeah. that's how it works now. Yeah. I find it helps like getting the structure in place at least, like tell it which header files you want it to uh, generate, kind of just putting all the initial legwork down. The rule with uh, using ChatGPT or reference code is they're totally allowed to do that as long as they have to be able to at least explain at a high level what the code is doing. So I'm just telling it kind of high level what I want it to do, up and down arrows to adjust hue and brightness for the LED, and then text display to kind of show current values. All right, so let's just take this code in here and analyze it. So one thing annoying thing I have to do with platform I is I always have to redefine the function declarations at the top. All right, so we set up the pin 38, switch GPIO, initialize SPI, TFT, and I have three sliders for each color. All right, so my switch state, for some reason, it's not being updated, so let me debug what's going on. Oh, I might have the actual button, the wrong orientation. That'd be an easy fix. Oh, it's like one of those that are like switch diagonally. There we go. Yeah, now it works fine. I guess I'll go to the cloud stuff now. So, Nicholas, are you saying you've completed the first part then? Yes. So you're able to read the switch and also control the RGB LED from the display touchscreen? Yes. So for the cloud part, I'm going to use something called SST. That's a pretty cool tool for like building cloud infrastructure as code. And I'm going to be using AWS for the back end to actually implement it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So I'm going to set up a Next.js web app. I'm um, just following their document here. It uses TypeScript, so it's yeah, basically JavaScript. Yeah, well, you don't have to use Node.js, I guess. You could use like Bun or Dino, but I guess, yeah, when you deploy it on Lambda, it has to be Node. So yes, it's just Node, pretty much. So for this, I'm using Windows Subsystem on Linux. So what are you working on, Kevin? So I'm kind of doing the display from scratch, so like drawing triangle buttons, like adjusting it there. So I don't like the layout there, so I'm just kind of having it tweak some of that, and then I'm rotating the orientation, but I see like the generic shape of everything. I'm just cleaning it up now. Okay. And then next step will be identifying the location of uh, like those actual points, the X, Y value that it returns. So I'm going to implement a mono repo approach, which basically means I have backend and front end all in one repository. App name is invalid. It can only contain alphanumeric characters. Whoops. Okay. Wow. I can't believe it. it doesn't allow underscores. That's pretty standard. I don't know. It's kind of weird. We can send rockets to the moon, but we can't yeah, allow it's underscores. A yeah, so it's a problem. SST project already exists. Okay. That's an easy fix. It's cool that VS Code has like a nice integration with a WSL, so you can open up your Linux environment with VS Code and still get type safety and everything. This is cool. Oh, yeah, so I have to actually log into my AWS account, which was a sandbox account. You don't want to show your password there now? <laughs> <laughs> get my AWS bill to $10,000 a month. Yeah, that would be quite <laughs> dangerous to put that out publicly. Yeah, that's what's nice about SSO is like it creates temporary credentials for you. What you do is like in your root account, you create these AWS organizations. Then you can like containerize or like basically separate different projects. So like it's easy to control billing that way or control permissions. If one person gets access to a project, they don't get access to your whole root account. SSO, that's a single yeah, sign single on. Sign, yeah, sign on, yep. Yeah, okay. I mean, that way, yeah, you don't have credentials hard-coded anywhere in your repository. So now with this setup, we should be able to go ahead and do SST dev, which will then spin up the environment. Oh, failed to refresh cache credentials. No EC2. Why would that happen? Kevin, are you still tweaking the uh, chat code? the display uh, so no right now i'm just manually going in my code i don't like how it's identifying the touch location and so i'm cleaning up that right now so basically to check if it's within the button i'm just giving it like an xy coordinate for that location and then if it's within a radius of that so instead of it looking for like a single xy point you're giving a, a radius around that xy point that counts as a touch yeah so i'm i'm gonna go through here and read out like i'm gonna touch the screen read out what that xy point is and then just add some buffer around that so where are you stuck at nicholas or having problems well so i was able to log into my account but now it's still it's not able to find the credentials for some reason well if you guys didn't run into problems this wouldn't seem very realistic yeah, i right. think <laughs> oh i think i didn't set my providers oh that fixed it okay 
Oh, yeah. So, because, yeah, what's cool about SST is that it uses Pulumi under the hood, which is like a based on Terraform. It's like a way to build infrastructure as code, which allows you to use different cloud providers. If you want to use like GCP or Azure, in this case, I'm using AWS. So I didn't specify that. So I just had to specify, okay, I'm using AWS as my main provider. Okay, gotcha. It looks like that works. And then if I go to my local host, yep, we should have a simple Next.js app working. Cool. So we need to hook into AWS's IoT core. So let's actually get that working first, which just allows me to publish and subscribe to MQT topics. So what this is going to do is generate a role policy and certificates that I have to upload to my ESP32 so it can authenticate with AWS. Kevin, it looks like you uh, compiled some code successfully there. I did. Uh, so yep, I'm able to control the hue and brightness right now uh, just with some arrows here, up down arrows. Now I have to modify the logic for the updating the pin value. Okay, okay, for reading the GPIO pin and displaying that on the display. Yeah, okay. so right now it's uh, updating the values when there's a change with either the hue or brightness, but I also need to add the logic in for if there's a change to, to that pin value. So reading that kind of in the background. Sorry, we need to allow our ESP device to publish and subscribe to any topic. So I will need to create a policy. And this is because you may want different devices to only have access to different topics depending on your application. For now, we'll just actually let it do everything on all resources. Right? Very unsecure, but that's all right. Yeah, we won't worry about security so much on this project. All right, now I can do anything with an IoT core. I think I just need to expose the certificates. Okay, so they're using Arduino JSON library, pub sub client library. Okay, let's go back to our platform IO. So Kevin, you're adding the code now to read the, the GPIO pin, it looks like. Is that right? Uh, yeah, reading it and then updating the display whenever that value changes. Kevin, do you already have the portion working where you control the RGB LED or are you doing that next after the switch? Uh, that's already working. Yep. All right. So this is great. I think to do this, I'm going to create a new main file. Let's call it iottests.cpp. I'll just kind of bring in all this stuff. Looks like he's putting it in a secrets.h. Sounds good. So Platform IO has this cool thing where you can do a source filter. So if you want to have multiple setup loop main files in your source folder, you can just tell it which file you want to do. Just a nice convenient way just to quickly test new things without having to create a new project or do anything fancy. So now I need to take the Amazon certificate, the root certificate, and then paste that in here. Beautiful. A device certificate. And then we put the private key and I'm not sure which one is which. All right, so that be good technically. So let's see, we try to connect to Wi-Fi, boom, boom. I am still trying to figure out this pin thing. It's gonna be more trouble. Sometimes the uh, simplest things become the most complex part. I had my pin logic within the if statement of the touch screen. So that's why it was only updating when I was touching it. Oh, that's interesting. I usually try to keep everything a bit cleaner, but I'm a little pressed for time. Yeah, I can adjust hue, brightness. We can go full brightness down to zero. And I see that pin value. Okay, I am done with step one. Okay, excellent. I'm going to do something similar. I'm going to create another main function for this link portion and then just kind of get that portion working, get this one working, and then kind of tie them up together at the end. Hey, all right, it's connected to AWS. Great. So it looks like we have communications working and we're getting data from our device. Cool. Not too bad. Well, that's good. So what's cool about SST is like what it helps with is like when you create resources in AWS, you're able to link them to other resources you create. So it automatically figures out the permissions and how that has to work with the IAM policies. Now I'm just setting up the front end to do a simple MQTT test with SST following their docs. Kevin, are you doing anything yet with Blink? So with Blink, you just have to kind of link, they call it like virtual pins, and you have to link up the pin to the specific variable that you're doing on the ESP32. And then that's kind of how it routes it back to the Blink server side. So is kind of the primary advantage of using Blink over like, let's say, AWS or custom web page is Blink just kind of simplify the process or is it? Yeah. So here's actually uh, the console I created. So you can pretty much come in and like you have a slider ready. So I put in two sliders and then the like a little LED indicator here for the pin value. Gotcha. So Blink allows you to create like a graphical user interface or a dashboard then basically. Yeah. And it gives you like few simple tokens that you put in your 
your script and then it kind of runs in the background and keeps everything synchronized okay so like here you see that it like rgb hue that's on virtual pin one so i just have to line that v1 up on my esp32 in that code gotcha okay yeah blank is great i used it one time it was pretty pretty sweet yeah especially if you want something that looks really nice i'm not familiar with the way you're doing it nicholas if you're going to have any kind of graphical slider or anything oh, yeah. like that i want to get all that my idea is to have ChatGPT generate that i just need to set it up so i'm doing something different now i'm actually using quad ai now to try to generate the code for the rgb control in the front end so I'm trying to showcase both ai tools so people can see you didn't switch for like a reason like chat gbt wasn't working right or giving you bad answers you're just trying to show the variety diversity here of tools well cool. so basically i just told it okay just give me three sliders to control an RGB LED through an MQTT topic, and then also subscribe to a topic in real time that allows me to see the state of the GPIO. Pretty simple. And then I'll just use the same topics on the ESP. Okay, looks like it gave me the sliders. Um, I'm also using uh, Shad CN, which is a really slick UI builder. So people can check that out. It's, it's really nice because it's not like a library. It's actually you download the source code into your project. So you have total ownership of the UI code, but it's already stylized with Tailwind and everything. It looks nice. Kevin, you're just working on merging your, your two pieces of code from part one and part two. Yeah. I'm trying not to let it get uh, too messy. The um, AWS has a MQTT server, right? So what happens is if I want to just send an RGB state to the ASP32, the front end code, which has these sliders, is publishing to a rgb topic so now i have to take this topic name and then go to my asp32 and then subscribe from that topic name to uh, actually read in the rgb state and then change the rgb effectively so uh this was the main uh, script i had used for connecting to blink and now i'm just kind of piecing that all together into one main function let's see how well it does at merging two pieces of code with a common objective so you can see the steps here integrating mqtt and tft this is something for like the other versions of ChatGPT. it didn't do too well so what are you doing there kevin i see you adding some new code is this uh, necessary to get the two halves to merge together i have them talking for the most part but when i update the hue or brightness from blink it's not updating on the screen so i'm just adding some logic that if uh, the hue value has changed since the last time it was checked then to update that data on the screen i'm touching the touch screen here it's changing the color and then it's updating it on blank as well so that was what i was trying to piece together making everything talk to each other okay i'm gonna call my time i'm happy with it okay excellent can you maybe go ahead and just give it an overview of yours yeah so pretty much everything is just in this one main file here main.cpp so no additional like custom libraries that i did but basically bringing in i use the adafruit library for the screen for the display portion but then i had to find a different library for the actual touch portion so there's a library handling the actual display and then another library handling the touch logic all that's going over the spy port there and then the adafruit neopixel library for defining the single rgb led that we have and then for blink you have to create a timer that kind of runs in the background and manages how frequently you're you're pushing and pulling updates from the blink server some variables here to set up the location of the arrows on the screen so i'm just doing it like raw like putting in x y position variables to draw those shapes global variable tracking for hue and brightness and then doing some function declarations at the top of the file just because you can't utilize them prior to them being declared so you just kind of declare them in their raw format here without any actual functionality described and then at a later in the code you can actually say what they're doing here with link i'm pretty much creating a callback function that will send sensor data over to the blink server so this is going from the esp32 over to blink so i'm writing to the different virtual pins the uh, pin state the hue the brightness so that's what is updating on the blink server when i'm touching the screen locally here and it's pushing that update over there and then you have a uh, blink write callback functions and those are what are pulling the variable from the blink server and then pushing it to the associated variable here so like i'm pulling from virtual pin one and assigning it to hue and then i'm updating the neopixel right after doing that and then i have my setup function where i'm just declaring all the different or starting the different touchscreen and the display setting the orientation so like i had to configure like it was flipped 
180 degrees, so I had to adjust that. Connecting to Wi-Fi and then connecting to Blink, it was pretty easy. You just, when you create that display on the Blink side, it gives you a token that you declare here. And then I put in my password and Wi-Fi information. So I did a super loop approach. So at the start of each loop, I'm calling Blink and the timer associated with that. And that's just forming the updates as required. Then I'm checking if that hue or brightness changed since the last time I measured it. If so, I'm updating the display. So that was the last thing I was figuring out over here. And then we come down here. There's a big chunk of code here that's just if the touch screen is touched, then it enters this and it pulls out the touch point and it's checking if the touch is inside that actual button that I drew on the screen. If so, updating the hue or brightness as required. And it's pushing all of that. And then uh, every loop it's checking the doing a digital read on that state pin. So it's probably occurring way faster than necessary, but works good enough for here. And it's pulling that. And if the value changed since the last time it read it, then it's updating the local display and then pushing that information to blink. Further on, this is the function for drawing the controls. Uh, so it's making the four triangles and then labeling them. Uh, so it's pretty much a triangle pointed up, pointed down for up and down and then you have labels on that. Updating NeoPixel, checking if the touch was inside each triangle, and then updating the display. So here it's pretty much erasing any of the previous text and then rewriting the text, hue, brightness, and pin 3 state. So I use the Adafruit ILI9341 library, which is just specific for the driver of the screen. So that's how I'm drawing the screen, but then I have another library, this XPT2046, and that's giving me XY coordinates. So when I had to do that calibration earlier, I had the Adafruit library print out my shapes, and then I was printing out on the serial line like the XY values, and so then I went into my configuration file and adjusted what the XY locations for each of those shapes was. The arrows to update hue, the arrows to update brightness. Right now, hue is zero. This hasn't been updated, but as soon as I touch it, we're updating our hue. You can take that all the way down to zero. That, and then if I push the button, right now it's high, low, huh? And if I come over here to blink, you can see that it's reading the same value as that, 65, 51. If I push the button, doop, doop. And then also I can change it over here on blank. So you'll see the screen update and the RGB LED. So 149 here, I'll set it to zero, zero. Change the brightness to 255, set it. All right. So it looks like I got it working now, so I can see the GPIO state and then control RGB just fine. I'm just uh, making it to where, because since it's doing it in real time, if I slide very slowly, it's trying to send a lot of messages, and then that kind of overflows on the ESP side because it's receiving all of these, so I'm just rate limiting it such that it hopefully now only sends max every 100 milliseconds. Well, this all seems to be working now, so... Okay, so you can do your review. Well, I'll start with the front end stuff, but it's really the front end and back end stuff. But essentially, so I used SST for this, which lets you build infrastructure as code and it nicely ties in the back end and front end. So everything's linked up and has the right permissions. So let me go to the config real quick. So all I'm doing is I'm creating a real time object that allows me to get access to the MQTT server from AWS IoT. And then I have an authorizer function, which for now, all that does is it lets you pass in like a token that a device would use, and then it would return what topics it can publish and subscribe to. For now, my authorizer function just allows all topics to keep it simple, but you would actually do your security here. And then I'm also creating a new uh, Next.js web app. And another cool thing SST does is it actually builds the Next.js. It has like their own open compiler that bundles all the code together to deploy that. And then I'm linking the real time such that it can have access to the MQTT endpoint. Then I have some simple kind of front-end code that it subscribes to the topics that I pass in, which are just the RGB control and GPIO. And then it has a simple UI slider to do the actual RGB modifications. And then it has a little preview window for it. So you can see it here, what that looks like. So as I change the color, we'll just show you a little preview of what it looks like. And then it goes ahead and publishes that. If I do all green, then I can do all blue, all red. And then if I hit the switch, 
toggle switch on the UI for the GPIO state. I guess you can call it production ready almost in terms of like the infrastructure. So there's no like third party service and it's all working through the cloud. So it's all being handled by AWS. I guess from the Arduino side, it's just your basic TFT stuff from the TFT ESPI library. And we're handling Wi-Fi connections and reconnects, AWS connections reconnects. And then we're able to do all their certificates, private keys connect to the server and then it creates these message callbacks here yeah so we have like a message handler and so all we do is we use client.set callback and this kind of implements a free rtos in the background where it's just doing like an event handler for that um, so i can just set as many callbacks as i want but ideally you just do one callback and then you're able to filter through the topics in that callback red and then so if i control it with this if i do all green and then we can do all blue. Push button. If you enjoyed this battle video, then definitely check out this one next.